Good afternoon, everybody. Sego, bojo, oni, tanse. I'm Trevor Phillips. I'm a staff member at Indigenous Services, and uh, we have partnered with a number of other people to bring this uh, talk together for you. Standing a little close to the mic here. Uh, I would uh, just like to welcome you all to the last talk this afternoon. The Honorable James Bartleman is here to talk about uh, the current contemporary Indigenous experience. And uh, I'll be emceeing things a little bit, as well as introducing uh, Honorable James Bartleman. So I'd like to bring up Candace Burnett, the Director of Indigenous Services, to do a formal uh, gesture of greeting. Candace. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon on this beautiful fall day. Uh, my name is Candace Burnett, and I, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the territory that we, um, we are located in. Um, here in London, Ontario, southwestern Ontario. Um, historically, the Adirondrin or the neutral people uh, once settled this region uh, alongside the Haudenosaunee and the, um, Anishinaab the Anishinaabe or Algonquin people. Today, uh, London, Ontario is home to a diverse Indigenous population um, as well as uh, other newcomers to, to, this, uh, to this country. Um, and just outside of London, um, not very far at all, about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, are three vibrant First Nations communities. They are the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, the Oneida Nation of the Thames, and the, uh, the Lenape, the uh, Muncie Delaware Nation. And I felt that it was appropriate to begin uh, this talk this evening with an acknowledgement of the territory and the land and place that we, we call home. Um, Next, I'd like to hand it over to Trevor to just give us a little bit of background about our guest this evening. I'm, I'm very honored to be part of, of uh, bringing uh, the Honorable Lieutenant Governor, our uh, former Lieutenant Governor, uh, James Bartleman, to, to, to uh, be part of this Words Festival. This is uh, very exciting for Indigenous Services to be part of, so I'll hand it back over to Trevor. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. Uh, again, I'm Trevor Phillips. I work for Indigenous Services in Youth Outreach and Program Coordinating. I also work with graduate students and I do a little bit of writing tutoring there. I'm currently doing my PhD in Indigenous Literature at Queen's, so that's the kind of crossover we got going on. I'm originally from central Alberta. I grew up just outside of Edmonton, West Edmonton, a little Métis community called uh, Callahoo, for all of you who might be familiar of it. So it's a long way from home for me. Not so far away from home for our speaker today, who is from the uh, Chippewas of the Rama First Nation, uh, the Ojibwe territory near uh, Aurelia in Lake Kuchiching. I had the privilege of spending some time in Lake Kuchiching this winter, uh, Mr. Bartleman, and it was, it was beautiful to be there on the doorstep of the body of water and watch the wind blow over and cover the town across the way. And it was very inspiring, and I wrote a story about a, about a badger and a, and a bear having dinner together. But it's not about my writing, it's about Mr. Bartleman's writing today. Uh, absolutely, the 27th Lieutenant Governor of Ontario and the Vice Regal Representative. The political uh, diplomatic career uh, for our speaker today is long and it is uh, prestigious. Um, when I tore out a piece of paper to write it down, I quickly ran out of room to, uh, to catch it all. But uh, uh, a couple of the, the key key highlights to, uh, to acknowledge in his work as, a, as, a, as an ambassador for the, the nation of Canada. Uh, ambassador to Cuba, obviously in the early 80s, Director of Security and Intelligence. High Commissioner to Cyprus and the Ambassador to Israel work, did work, Ambassador work with uh, NATO in the early 90s. Commissioner to South Africa and Australia. And a lot of this work informing some of the nonfiction work he wrote and his memoirs uh, when he was uh, in office as the Lieutenant Governor. Um, as part of his mandate in his term as Lef Lieutenant Governor from 2002 and 2007, he had three main goals. The first one was to reduce the stigma of mental illness. The second one was to uh, fight racism and discrimination. And the third, and the one I'm uh, most proud of that you did, was promote literacy among First Nations children. As an Indigenous uh, scholar working on Indigenous literature, I've come into contact with your work in, that, in the community in that regard, predominantly in Northern Ontario, where you set up um, a, the, left, the Lieutenant Governor's book drive and um, managed to bring in over $1.2 million, or $1.2 million books in donations to the Northern Ontario communities for Indigenous children to read. The twinning program, which brought into contact uh, First Nations communities and uh, non-First Nations um, people and to inspire literacy amongst youth. Um, the uh, summer literacy camps that go on all over the Northern Ontario region and the Club Amisk Book Club. Is it Amisk? We say Amisk out west, or do you say it differently? Amic, okay, because that's beaver, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we say Amisk where I'm from. My dad's actually named Damascus. Um, uh, some of the part of the bibliography 
that we have, as I mentioned, the, the nonfiction writing that he did previous to now the new turn towards young adult uh, fiction. And uh, As Long as the River Flows, which was published in 2011, and was uh, a finalist for the uh, prestigious Burt Award for First Nations, Métis, Inuit Literature. Uh, also on that, uh, on that panel of finalists, Richard Wagamese's Indian Horse, which is a, a very popular book that took Canada by storm, so in elite company there in terms of contemporary Indigenous authors. And uh, a more recent book, The Redemption of Oscar Wolfe, a picaresque novel uh, that was described at, in the London Free Press recently as an absorbing, oh, excuse me, I got really excited there, an, an absorbing <laughs> and enchanted uh, journey with crisp commentary on the reality of unintended consequences. So that sounds fascinating, and I'm sure uh, we'll speak to consequence and some of the other themes that come out in that book today. The talk that you're here to all hear, all here to hear is the Aboriginal Canadian as outsider, and I'm very pleased to welcome to the front of the room uh, the Honorable James Marvel to speak. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I have a connection with London in that uh, I went to, I did my grade 13 at London Central Collegiate back in 1958-59, and then I went to Western for four years, and so I have a, that, that connection. And it's been a pleasure to come back uh, over the years. So the title sounds uh, very academic, The Aboriginal Canadian as Outsider. Uh, I've written three novels, As Long as the Rivers Flow, The Redemption of Oscar Wolfe, and exceptional circumstances, and in all three of them, uh, Native people are portrayed in one way or another as the outsider in society. In the, as long as the rivers flow, the, I wrote it from the point of view of a Native woman. When my, in my travels in Northern Ontario, and the government of Ontario puts at the disposal of the Lieutenant Governor a twin-engined uh, King aircraft, and Lieutenant Governors make community visits. So I use that to uh, get to travel into all the remote communities of Northern Ontario, because otherwise it wouldn't have been possible. There are no, no year-round roads to 26 of the communities, and there's only ice roads in the winter, and you have to be pretty, uh, not brave, but they're, they're really rough rides into the communities. So I went in to the communities and discovered that uh, the situation of the children was terrible, that um, uh, they, there was a suicide epidemic going on, had been going on for years. I first of all flew into uh, Kaseshawan, which is right across the river from Fort Albany. Uh, and uh, when I, the plane was circling to land, there was a, a plane taking off, a great crowd of people at the airport. And so after we landed, I asked the chief what was going on. And he said that a 13-year-old girl had killed herself by melting Tylenol-3 and injecting herself with it until she died. She wanted to die. And they were flying her out to Timmins for an autopsy. And I said, why did she do it? And he said, uh, well, and it looked at me as if I was very naive. She said, well, she had no hope. Not too long afterwards, I got a call from Grand Chief Stan Beardy of the Anishinaabe Aski Nation. Uh, he was the Grand Chief for the 49 communities in this political grouping, 49 First Nations occupying about two-thirds of the land mass of Ontario. And he said that three kids at uh, Wanaman Lake First Nation had killed themselves, and uh, they were part of a suicide pact. They were the kids in the combined grades seven and eight. The community was in a state of shock, and he wanted me to come up just to show the community that the rest of the province cared. He said, nobody cares. 
Uh, and so I picked Stan up and we flew into Wonderman Lake and uh, the kids at the school, I went to see the kids and the, the kids in the combined, those who were left in the combined grade seven and eight class, and there were only about a, a dozen or more of them there at that time, they all looked to be in a terminal state of depression. No one would lift their head. They had, had the hoodies over their heads, and they just looked down, absolute silence in the room. And I could tell that a lot of them wanted to do the same thing, kill themselves. And when I asked the families what had happened, they said that they knew that something was wrong, but they didn't know what. Because what is very common up in those communities is that when there is a suicide pact among the kids, they, the first one dies, and then the others uh, are visited. And they, they don't say in their dreams, but probably in their dreams, because it's a very real thing for the members of the community visited by the person who killed herself. And the person says, it's your turn. Nobody has ever kept their word with us. Now you have given your word and you have to die. And the second one dies. And then those two spirits visit the third. And when they start hearing about the visitation of of the dead, people are very worried. And that's a fairly common thing up there. So a very heart-rending situation. And then I visited the Mishkokogamang First Nation, which is just south of Pickle Lake. This is the community that uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu visited. I had lunch with Archbishop Tutu when I was Lieutenant Governor in Toronto. And I also had met him in South Africa when I was Canada's High Commissioner there. And I told him you know, what I was doing, my priorities and all the rest. And, and he said that in 1990, as it was, he came to Canada to thank the Mr. Mulroney and the Conservatives for leading the fight internationally against apartheid, for standing up to Margaret Thatcher and Reagan and others, and promoting a societies free of racial discrimination and equality. And he was glad to do that. And as a matter of fact, I came back with Mandela later when I was High Commissioner in South Africa. And he wanted to come back to come and thank Canada for what they had done to fight apartheid. But uh, Archbishop Tutu said that uh, he, had been, he was invited by the chief of Mishkogagamang to go visit. And he went up to Mishkogagamang. And he said it was worse than anything in the black townships. That he couldn't understand how internationally we would be promoting and standing up for human rights and, uh, and uh, fair treatment, fight against discrimination, when we tolerated such a situation as existed in Mishkogwagamang. The When I went into the community, I was brought in by the RCMP, uh, the OPP. Uh, what I saw going in were uh, fresh graves, lots of fresh graves. And, the, and they were on the graves, there were fishing equipment, there were dolls, there were uh, baseball hats. And the chief told me that they had had, in the past decade, something like 200 violent deaths in that community of a population of about 1,500. Not all by suicide, but a lot by suicide. He said people hated themselves. People wanted to die, the kids in particular. And I went by houses, brand new houses that had been built, 
and the, the windows had been smashed out and all the furniture thrown out on the snow. The kids, he said it's because the kids hate themselves and they want to self-destruct, they will destroy anything. And, but suicide was, among the kids was prevalent. And so, um, I thought back to when I was a kid and uh, what had been the major factor which had, we talked last night, for those of you who are here, about luck. Anybody here talk, heard, heard us talk about luck? Yeah. I had been lucky, but it didn't, hadn't appeared that way at the beginning. Uh, coming from the bottom of the social economic scale, my parents having about a grade four education. Um, my dad always assumed that his two boys would grow up to be ditch diggers like uh, he was. But, you know, I did a little ditch digging, but it's most boring, boring, hard, underpaid work. Come home, my dad come home, always cover the dirt and mud and paid to, you know, the bottom of the scale. And, uh, 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 and so I didn't want to be a ditch digger, but what I had going for me was that in that first summer in Port Carling, after we came there right after the war, we lived up by the dump, and my brother and I used to chase the garbage trucks up to the dump. And I had, a, in those days, uh, there were lots of comic books up there. And Port Carling is in the center of a very wealthy area of lots of tourists. And they had to were throwing out their comic books, and so I took them back to the tent, and my mother helped me make out the words, syllables, in the little bubbles. And when I started school, uh, I was well on my way to being able to read. Then I discovered the library, and that was really my ticket out of that life because I was able to dream of other worlds. I was able to dream of being something other than a ditch digger. And the other lucky things happened, as I mentioned last night. I uh, was a, a, a rich American, uh, decided that he would uh, support my uh, education by giving me the money to come to London, Ontario, and rent an apartment, and go to grade 13, and then go to Western. And so you have to think about your own life when you're, and your own experiences when you're trying to help other people. And I also wanted to try to give back if I could. And I had no, but I had no budget. I spoke to people in the federal government and they said, oh yes, yes, I got kisses on both cheeks and nothing happened. And so, and then when I talked to people in the provincial government, they said, well, um, if we start helping, then we're going to be stuck and the federal government will make us pay for everything. This is a conversation I've had with the current premier a number of times. Because the needs are so great, you would think they would just cut through the red tape and help. And so I decided that I would try to enlist the, uh, the goodwill of the people of Ontario. I mean, they, there's a lot of racism, but there's also a tremendous amount of goodwill and people don't know life on Native communities, um, but they're aware that things are pretty bad up north. And so I decided I would establish libraries because there were no libraries in those communities. Matter of fact, a lot of the schools were really broken down. And the teachers were doing their best, but they were not, they didn't, you don't have to be, a, to have a teaching certificate to teach in those communities. You can. Uh, it's so hard to get teachers, they give you a, a letter, you go in. So sometimes you don't get the, the most uh, mature uh, teachers going into the, those places. And in many cases, they go into a state of culture shock and leave at the first opportunity. And then they have to bring in another uh, young teacher or uh, someone willing to go into the community. So there's a revolving door, and the literacy levels were terrible. Um, and so I thought, 
Uh, if we establish libraries, the kids at least would be able to have a place to turn to, to read. And so I uh, sent a press release to the, to the uh, Association of Community um, Newspapers, about 200 of them, small newspapers across the province. And they published it. And the teachers and the librarians all rallied behind. The first thing I knew, books were arriving at Queen's Park. And uh, I didn't have any resources for them, so the commissioner of the OPP came to a dinner I gave, and I was sitting beside her, and I said, can you help get these books into the communities and help collect them? And she thought I was talking about a few thousand books. And she said, sure. <laughs> and so I went on Ontario Today, I went on CBC News, I brought the CBC uh, uh, correspondence with me into the communities, the National came up, uh, and I said, we want good used children's books to bring into the communities. And to take them to the OPP detachment closest to you. <laughs> and so they were overwhelmed. I had stories at the beginning that the uh, one sergeant tried to arrest a person who brought so many books. <laughs> and uh, but we cleared, cleared that up because that became the real priority. And so they filled up their, they had to put the park, their cars outside and the garages filled up. And that's what they needed to sort them. So I went to the military and asked them if they would put a, a Downsview at my disposal. So they put Downsview at my disposal and Manitoulin Transport from Manitoulin Island uh, brought, collected books and brought them in and we did two book drives, a total of well over two million books in two drives, which we sorted down to about a million and a half. And then we, uh, no way of getting into them into the communities, which remains a problem to this day, but the, uh, there's an organization called the the Rangers, a native organization called the a military organization, and they go in on the winter roads and they brought in many tractor trailer loads into the communities. The, the military um, parachuted books in, and I was so proud of that. I got the Global, the National, CTV, what all. We all went up to Fort Severn and it was about 40 below. The snow was up to our necks, and uh, we were there to record and let the people of Ontario know that all measures were being taken to deal with the problems of illiteracy and to give children things to read. So we heard this big C-130 transport coming up the, the, uh, the river. Uh, the Severn River. I thought it was like the, the, uh, a thunderbird of old. Roar, roar, roar. And then it came into view. And the back was down. There's a big lift where trucks and things are located. And then as they got pretty close to us, we're all standing in the river on ice. The these huge boxes came tumbling out, and many of them went straight down without the parachutes opening. We had books scattered all over. And the uh, media said, uh, Your Honor, is this the way it's supposed to be? <laughs> I said, no problem. But everybody went out in their snowmobiles and went home, and were picking books out of the snow and dusting them off. And, uh, the next run, which they did at another community, went off perfectly because they were just practicing, I guess. <laughs> and then a native airline uh, stepped in, Wase Airlines, and they, if they had charged the commercial rate, it would have been over $600,000, but they donated all of that, and they brought the books into the communities. So our libraries were established, and it was really nice to go up and you'd see the kids lining up to borrow books like they do here in London, Ontario. Then I decided that I would establish a book club. And, and because the chief at a very 
a community with a lot of problems, uh, a can't come. Uh, he said, when I was a little boy, great big giant guy, okay, we had a club at school, the teacher organized called the Bookworm Club. Uh, that was so wonderful. I thought, well, that's a good idea. So I went back and I organized, I raised a million and a half dollars, and which I gave to the Southern Ontario Library Service and came up with the concept of providing one brand new uh, children's book, good quality, to all children in all the flying communities of Northern Ontario every three months and establish their own, their own uh, uh, magazine. And soon that was up and running, and it's still running to this day. And then I set up summer reading camps. I raised $7 million, and I had pilots, and I chose Frontier College to run with it. And they are now, even though I'm no longer involved directly, uh, it went from 25 communities, all the First Nation flying communities of Ontario, to 86 across Canada last summer. And in many of these communities, it's the only thing that the kids have going. They go in with, they take about, they, about 200 university uh, students who are trained, and they uh, take about 1,000 or 2,000 books into each community, and they uh, focus on learning to read in a fun way. And it's really wonderful. And then I established uh, literary prizes uh, for young Aboriginal students in Ontario. But the suicides didn't stop. Uh, the problems in the community are so deep-rooted that uh, ways have to be, only governments really can intervene. And what governments have to do, first of all, is to provide the same level of funding and services to Native people as to non-Native people in terms of educational funding and child welfare funding and all the rest of it. But they don't do it. And it's a national shame. The United Nations has drawn attention to it. And they don't do it because they, don't, they know they wouldn't get any political credit for it because the population as a whole, it's good to give books, uh, but in terms of getting excited about um, the uh, suicide of Native kids in the North, you know, they, people have problems of their own. They really, not that they don't care, it's just that the people up there are invisible to them. And so, when I, finished my term as Lieutenant Governor, and I was no longer able to raise funds and all the rest of it. I was able to encourage the programs that I started and to continue, especially with Frontier College, to be active. I decided to focus on trying to make the, in, in a modest way, members of the Canadian public aware of Native condition as seen from the inside. So my first book was As Long As the Rivers Flow. And in it, uh, the protagonist, uh, Martha, goes to the St. Anne's School in Fort Albany. And I describe, as these ladies who told me their stories described to me, uh, you know, how they were taken from their communities on uh, float planes uh, and if the parents didn't let the kids go, the parents could go to jail. Uh, and so, because it was the law that they could be, had to be separated from their, from their children. The idea was that you would take the children, put them in a type of reform school environment, um, almost like jails, little jails, but they didn't look upon them that way. And you would turn them into white people at the end of 10 years. So they uh, went home, so they went to the communities, and they were, and this was starting, started 100 years ago. Uh, and so for generation after generation, the native kids up in those communities were removed from their parents at the age of six, 
They would go back for the summers, and every time they went back, they know less and less about their language and culture until when they did go back, they were outsiders, and that's one of the terms I use in this lecture. So they were outsiders in their communities, alienated from their parents. They didn't know how to live on the land like their the first generation did. And worse than that, uh, they were rejected in, many, in some cases, many cases, by their parents. Because the parents weren't used to raising them. And they turned to each other. And when they went to, and, and they, they felt, when they went out on the winter roads to Thunder Bay, they experienced the racism of society, pretty open in those days, still pretty open in these days. And they felt uh, rejected, outsiders in that. And so then they lost their culture to a great extent. So they had no roots to fall back on. And so when I was going up there, uh, they would, uh, they were, they had started, the suicide epidemic started in uh, 1987, shortly after the last residential school closed and the winter roads to the outside opened up and there was a relationship there. And the kids began to kill themselves. And uh, so I wanted that story to be told. So I have Martha going to the school at the age of six, being abused by the priest identified to me by these ladies, um, returning home at the age of 16, her mother rejecting her, um, getting pregnant, uh, becoming heavy drinker, uh, beaten up by her husband, her husband leaves, she gets her life together, um, and she decides to go to the big city, um, and she finds in the big city that she felt more at home than she did on the reserve. Because on the reserve, because of the fundamentalist uh, missionaries, and I, I don't have any, I, you know, no judgment on, on anybody's religion, but they would not allow the kids to participate in powwows, the big drum, jingle dancing, didn't like native art, it was all the work of the devil. And they said the first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods behind, beside me. And so they, when they went to Toronto, they found that there was a vibrant native community there, that you had uh, dance groups, you had powwows, you had theater, and so she felt more at home there. But eventually she had to return to the reserve. And uh, the book is one of, of uh, forgiveness and the community coming together at the end. But that is that first book. It has been sent by Canada Council to every First Nation community across Canada. But then I decided to you know, that was the point of view of a woman. So then I decided to do one on the alienation uh, of native, that Native people felt. Um, you were talking about the, we're on the home of the people of the Neutrals and the Haudenosaunee and then now of the Senecas and the Chippewas and the um, others here. But we say those things, but really, um, I wonder, you know, in fact, it's the land of the white people here. But the Native people still feel that link. And it's a very emotional link. And where I grew up in Port Carling, there was a Native community, a thriving Native community in Port Carling in Muskoka, uh, with uh, farms, corn, uh, they had pigs, uh, they trapped, they hunted. And, but in the 18, late 60s, 1860s, 1870s, uh, the government decided they would open Muskoka up for colonization and they kicked the Indians out. They just told them to go. And uh, 
Many of them went to Perry Island, some went to Rama. And, and when I was growing up, I could see a number of their old log cabins. Because they turned their log cabins, first of all, the white people had moved into their houses. And then as they built bigger houses, they turned the, the uh, uh, log cabins into pig pens and stables. And they had plowed up the bones of the people, scattered them. And uh, uh, part of the history of Muskoka, which no one paid any attention to. And so, but, but I was you know, very conscious of that. And my mother, who passed away just a couple of years ago at the age of 92, you know, would often tell me about what it was like. She, she was born on Lake, on Lake Joseph during a fishing trip by her parents. Um, they lived, they spent their summers at the Indian camp in Port Carling, which was a small reserve there. And she had gone through a lot of, and she spent about a month in the spring and a month in the fall at the local white school. And she had a hard time there. She was dressed differently. I have a letter from somebody who, who met her in the early 30s and said she smelled of sweet grass which I think would be a lovely thing to smell of, but uh, also subject to a lot of names. She also told me about a, a fire, a fire which burned down the business section of Port Carling in 1930. And her mother was out walking on the path in the Indian camp, and somebody knocked her over, probably someone from the Indian camp, a native person, and he smelled of coal oil. And shortly thereafter, the bells, because in those days they used the church bells, there were two bells in every church. One was for calling people to worship on Sundays. The other one was to call them to come and fight fire. So there was a short one. So it was ding, 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 ding. And then you, she, she saw the flames, the light of the flames in the uh, town. Uh, as things burnt. The men of the Indian camp ran and joined with the white men of the village, and they tried to put it out, but they couldn't stop it. And my grandfather ran into a burning building and pulled out a tourist girl who was working as a maid, but she died. And I thought, I want to turn this into a novel, but the issue of alienation of land and the petty racism that existed in that period, and which continues to exist in a more subtle form today, so I wrote The Redemption of Oscar Wolfe. In a way, it reminds me of the self-homegrown jihadists. I'm not, making, I'm not uh, uh, saying that in any way you compare frustrated native youth to jihadists, but Oscar, this young man, he had been um, he had been, uh, he had had his pants pulled down when he was uh, six or seven years of age by some bullies at the Port Carling School. And then they held him, up, held him together, held him, and they called out at the group of girls, would you like to see this Redskins, you know what? And they said yes. And so he pulled it down, pulled down his underwear as well. So he ran home just completely humiliated. Just, and he went, went to see his grandfather. I'm thinking of my own grandfather. But his grandfather said, you know, what you have to do if you're a native person in Canada is to fit in. Uh, the grandson thought that his grandfather would go and, he said, go and kick those kids and give them a licking. And if their fathers come, you uh, hit them because his grandfather had been a war hero, and he had killed lots of Germans, apparently. But his grandfather said, no, you just got to fit in. You just got to take it. But Oscar never accepted that. And when uh, he thought his mother was being abused by a white man, he just lost it. He felt marginalized. He was taken to fight into, to, 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 he decided to hit back I suppose, in a sense, that you know, young people who feel marginalized, no outlet, will do similar things. And so he burnt down the 
He was the one in my book who set fire to the village. And in the book I have, instead of the grandfather, like my grandfather, saving someone's life, I have him being burnt to death, together with the girl. And so this terrible violence as a result of being the outsider in white society in the, in the 1930s in Canada. And so the rest of the book is about how he seeks redemption for this deed. And so he decides that he's going to fit in because that's, the only, that's what his grandfather had told him to do. But that wasn't easy to do. So that's that book. Then the third one, Outsider as well, is about the post 9-11 security climate, security world in which we live. I have a Métis protagonist who is hired by the Department of External Affairs because of positive stereotypes. On the one hand, the Director General of Security Intelligence, that's a job I once had, uh, wanted him in the department because when he was a soldier in the Second World War, he had Métis soldiers, and they were mean SOBs. And he wanted mean SOBs. And, and the other member of the recruiting team wanted him in because he, talk, he thought of Métis as being noble savages. Everything they did was like Hiawatha paddling his canoe, dispensing wisdom, being nice. And they thought that if we have, uh, just have enough sufficient number of Métis and First Nation people in the Department of External Affairs, it will mean that human rights will gradually become more important to the Canadian government. So he is taken in under false pretenses, but he ends up being a hapless spy, and he ends up being uh, uh, at being uh, a member of the task force dealing with the FLQ crisis in 1970, which is something that I was a member of that task force, and being present at a cabinet meeting in which the government approved something called exceptional circumstances. That's the title of my book, and in exceptional circumstances, which is the truth, the government in 2010 authorized CSIS, the RCMP, DND, and the Communication Security Establishment to use information derived from torture in their work, which is contrary to all of the international agreements that Canada has ever had with the United Nations. And I was outraged. I wrote a letter to the Globe Mail saying that the minister had lost his moral compass. He had wrote back saying, no, 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 that we would only use that information in exceptional circumstances. But he didn't define it very well. The exceptional circumstances were threat to property, threat to lives. Well, so I thought I would write a book which would, have it, which would examine those issues. First of all, on the first level, it's a thriller. You can read it and not think about the ethical issues. But on the other level, it can be looked at as an examination of several things. For example, blood over uh, rights. When Albert Camus, the great Nobel Prize winning French uh, author, was receiving his Nobel Prize, he was asked about, because the Algerian War was going on, if, uh, uh, who do you support in Algeria? You know, your family lives in Algeria. You support the, the pieds noir, the people who want to keep the Algerians under their heel, or do you support the Algerians? And he said, the way to the only, even though he was a great human rights advocate, he said, what you, the, the criteria is, you support your family, first of all. And if your family is violating human rights, you stay with them just the same. So rights, so blood, family, comes over rights. And that is one of the things that drives a lot of, of national liberation wars, and uh, terrorist mythology and all the rest. And then I wanted to look at the, the issue of what is the correct balance between uh, civil liberties 
and national security in the post 9-11 world. And, uh, and then, most important of all, I wanted to have the protagonist be on a rendition mission, taking a dual national who was involved in, a, in the FLQ as a, as a member of the, one of the cells, one of the terrorist groups, expelled, like the government wants to do now, they're putting these rules forward, expelled to her country of origin, although she didn't really know it anymore, where they would torture her and send the information back to CSIS to be used. And so I have them on a plane trip discussing the, these issues. And then I have a, a long look at what torture does, as I see it in the writings of Mel Rowe and uh, Arthur Kussler and others. But, uh, and coming to the conclusion that if we support things like uh, the use of torture to get information, although we're very careful that we don't do the torturing ourselves, we send it to somebody else, or we just get the information from somebody else, then what does that mean for the nature of our society? And they picked, and I picked a Meiji because he was an outsider. And, uh, uh, and that book becomes available uh, next uh, April. It's called Exceptional Circumstances. And uh, I shared it with uh, Amnesty International, and they are, they are supporting it. And I'm giving them all the funds uh, from it. And so that is my, my presentation on the Aboriginal Canadian as outsider. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'd like to open up the floor now to questions uh, for the Honorable James Bar Barberman. He'll be happy to take any of your questions, I'm sure. I have a couple percolating in my head here, too, to get us started if we wanted to, but I'd, I'd love to open it up the floor first. Actually, I saw a hand come up right here. I have two questions. Would you care to comment on the distinction between land as a spirited relative and land as a resource commodity? Two worlds in conflict. Uh, and would you also comment perhaps on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, winding up its work in June of next year? What would reconciliation look like for us with a sensitivity for the outsider? I don't think there's a, a contradiction between land, uh, your attachment to land, because it's the land of your ancestors, and the use of that land uh, for your own economic benefit of your community. Um, so I think that there is no uh, difference there. But the language today is about the land as it's 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 the reason they oppose in mean, some communities. The development of resources is because the land is sacred. They don't want to disturb it. Many other places, they want the they want to be involved in the exploitation of the uh, lumber and the mineral resources. In terms of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I think that there will be no reconciliation until Native people receive the same uh, equality in terms of social justice as non-Native people. The Prime Minister made this apology several years ago, but it means meant nothing. I was there at the House of Commons, and everyone was so happy because they expected that that was just the first step, that there would be steps taken to, to give Native people the same level, Native children the same level of funding as non-Native children, etc. But that hasn't happened. And so there will never be reconciliation until uh, there is uh, social economic justice for Native people. Other questions? I wanted to pick up on this idea of apology leading off the first answer to the first question. 
And thinking about the most recent apology to come out as we've kind of entered into a, an era of apology and, uh, towards uh, you know, misdeeds done to indigenous communities by the colonial government. I'm curious to see what your thought is, the most recent one being by the uh, government of BC, the provincial legislature, uh, apologizing to the Tsitsklotan people for hanging their chiefs in the 19th century. And one of the things that stood out to me from testimony about that apology was by members of the community saying that that story, that event, had stayed with them for years and years and years and has defined uh, their community today. And the importance of that apology as a step in reconciliation, you talk about uh, economic justice or economic equality coming first, but I'm curious, uh, as, a, as, a, as a writer, where you think uh, the process of reconciliation takes place for indigenous communities and being and having their story heard and having that story acknowledged through apology. I would say words are cheap. You got to have action. Now, in terms of of the, these historic wrongs that people talk about, and you say everyone's apologizing. Well, I'm glad they are. But what is interesting today, as we are in the wake of the events on Parliament Hill, is that almost all those uh, great injustices, for example, the uh, uh, sending the rounding up Japanese Canadians and sending them to the uh, uh, work camps, uh, removing their right to vote, what all, um, uh, uh, occurred as a result of uh, some big national crisis. And in the wake of 9-11 in the United States, that was their national crisis, and they just uh, uh, threw away the law books, and they became involved in active torture in black sites around the world, uh, completely contrary to what their image of themselves. Uh, in wake of the FLQ crisis of 1970, the government found it very easy to declare the War Measures Act uh, to remove, which removed habeas corpus and all the rights and, of uh, citizens of Quebec. They rounded up 500 people, not one of whom was ever charged with anything because they weren't uh, in any way uh, members of the FLQ. When the news of Laporte's uh, death occurred, uh, the guards pulled them out of the, the prison cells and beat them, but no one, no one made any noise about that. And the population really supported it. And so if we have a major crisis, proportionately along the lines of the 9-11 crisis, uh, I have no doubt that we would do something similar in Canada. And, there's, and I'm very happy to see that this time, uh, in the wake of the crisis, on the Hill, that the uh, opposition parties are saying, no, just wait a minute, we need to look at our security rules, but we have to make sure that the rights and liberties of Canadians are preserved. In other words, don't uh, throw our rights and liberties out uh, because uh, for the sake of uh, national security, uh, we, because we want to keep our identity and our values. And so that is something which we have to watch. And I think I can speak for a lot of us in the room where we're watching the current administration's handling of this event aftermath uh, cautiously and hoping for measured response, absolutely. Uh, turning to some of your ideas about um, promoting literacy, which was your, part of your campaign when you were in the office. I'm curious to get your reading, your take on the current administration's focus on um, arts, literature, and the humanities, and uh, how that speaks to some of your interests, especially in Indigenous communities. I can't answer that. I don't know <laughs> the answer to that. <laughs> Too big? Yeah. Does anybody else have a question? Yes, I, I wondered whether you would think that the current uh, situation of these very remote communities, and a great number of them isolated, uh, in the north, whether that's a structure for anything positive, or whether in fact that whole situation has to be overturned in order to give the community purpose, or the people feel purpose. When you say overturn, you mean 
Well, around about the center. Is there some other social system that would work better, or is there something that can be injected into the community that would give it life and, and hope? But in terms of uh, in terms of system, I think uh, you know democracy, liberal democracy, is the way to go. Votes, electing their leaders, uh, provide. I think there has to be uh, a in terms of the communities that are so troubled in the north. You need a a uh, many different interventions at the same time, and you have your approach is like doing development work in the third world. You have to uh, be engaged in community development. You have to provide capacity to the communities by uh, promoting literacy, education, and having people who can run the power plant. They're having people who uh, can uh, uh, be the nurses and uh, others. And those who don't want to stay in the community can go and work and join the mainstream Canadian population, but they have to have that. Uh, you have to have, and this is something that in Northern Ontario that a number of the leaders are working on, the whole issue of strengthening families. I've been to, I was to, when I was Lieutenant Governor, I went as a guest to a huge tent revival meeting style gatherings. Uh, where up to a thousand people from those communities came in and they brought in speakers who had been in jail, who had abused their families and all the rest of it. They have healing circles and in, in my book I, I describe one of those healing circles where the parents say, you know, I was a bad parent. You know, I should have watched, I should have paid more attention to my daughter before we found her hanging you know, from a, a coke rack in the closet, it's my fault, you know. I, when she complained about her grandfather touching her in bad places, we did nothing, we blamed her. Uh, so family strengthening is a major thing. And at these gatherings, they had uh, family counselors there so the husbands and wives could talk. So that's a, another major thing that has to be done. Then you need economic development, and so you have to be sure that the Native communities get their fair share of the resources that are being developed in those communities. It has to be a multidisciplinary thing. You can't just solve, deal with education and say that that's going to be the panacea. It has to be education. It also has to be family strengthening. There are over 100,000 Native children in care across Canada. And they receive far less on a per capita basis than white kids in care. Those you have to have strength in families so that those kids stay at home. In the uh, my Aboriginal uh, literary prizes that uh, I asked to be established when I left, uh, we get about 500 stories and short stories and poems from uh, Métis, First Nation, and Inuit kids in Ontario. And one of the themes is alienation, unhappiness, a uh, little girl walking through her First Nation at home. All the furniture has been sold to fuel oxycodone purchase, purchases. There's no food to eat because the food money has all gone to buy drugs. She's hungry. She walks by a neighbor's house, the family are sitting down to dinner, and she wishes that she was a member of that family. That's the type of so many of the stories uh, and poems that, that have been seen, that I've, that I've seen. There is a major crisis in many of these communities. And when I was working, I, uh, I still continue to go up, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, the one that just, uh, retired, uh, he, he, I went with his wife because he, was, he wasn't able to, uh, able to travel. And so I kept in touch with the communities. Um, and what I saw was more and more drug use, more and more introduction of gangs. At the same time, on my little side, Frontier College reports that the kids are retaining far more of what they're 
learning in school by going to these summer reading camps. So we're, we're doing some good there. But that's not going to solve the problems. That, there has to be a change in the attitude of Canadians. Because until there's a change in the attitude of Canadians, positive change, the government's not going to do anything because they're not going to get any votes for that. And maybe not around here, but in Western Canada, there's huge, huge problems of racism against Native people. And so you're not going to get votes out there. And if you're not going to get votes, why do anything? And so that's why I write my little novels and try to get people to look at it from the inside. Yeah, question in the back. I have two questions. Uh, first one I'll ask publicly, the second one I'd like to talk to you afterwards. Um, what might your thoughts be on like three, two major problems as I see with First Nations, uh, Indian people, especially in say, Ontario, are education and healthcare. Those are both provincially mandated. Do you think that the Indian Act and maybe some of these things should be under provincial legislation or under provincial jurisdiction, uh, still allowing like with transfer payments or whatever through the federal government, but in other words, I guess, do you think there should be some restructuring of the Indian Act and maybe some, some of the major problems like health care and education maybe under more local government uh, you know, administration or where it's closer to the people? Uh, that makes sense on a logical level. Uh, because the expertise, can you hear me already? Because the expertise is uh, in terms of education, it's all provincial level. Uh, the federal government is not in business of running elementary and secondary schools. So they don't do anything. It's to the local communities, and they don't know how to run them either. And, uh, uh, but I don't see it ever happening that the, the chiefs the communities would uh, let their gov federal government off the hook in the sense that their treaties are with the federal government. And there's, there's a per and some, some treaties that for provincial government sign them off, they're with the federal government. And <coughs> they, well, that will never happen. Well, you don't need a mic, I don't need one either. I can have a great right now. Oh, you didn't know that? I think that's for the filming. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because that's what all the other 
groups in society. Scottish mm -hmm. dancers, yes, exactly. Ukrainian uh, uh, Easter eggs, or uh, and whatever, uh, and retaining your 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 rich culture and being a Canadian. I mean, I'm sure you, you South Africa you could have you could have barbecues, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> and not be alienated from your society. Yeah, but I, I kind of feel like the government, you know, I don't have that much respect for government, most governments, but I think um, that it's reconciliation, it's not dealing with the heart, because that's what was broken, and that's what, why it's so difficult, and that's what needs to be healed for things to come forward. Because yeah. I still see that broken, because you see the, the, the families are not supported enough. So they pass on their frustration there to the children. And yeah, that's the greatest think, impact on the children. I don't see that there's any reconciliation. No, I term. don't at all. It's, it's, but it's, just, but it's, it has, I guess it has other instruments. I, mean, I, I, I was exactly. in South Africa uh, during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission okay. meeting. And, but there, it, it served a different purpose because they were reconciling vicious vicious actions by the mm -hmm. white security forces, uh, slaughter of people, torture and uh, killing of uh, community leaders. And unless they found some way of dealing with that, the country would never move ahead. So that was a, a number one virtually national priority. And so they brought these killers in and they, confront, they confronted the people, the families, and then they and they told what had really happened. And sometimes they said they were sorry, sometimes they didn't. But there was, they brought them together to have a catharsis so that they could get on and lead their lives. Here, in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you never brought, they never brought the, the nuns and the priests and the United Church ministers and the teachers who had raped and done all these things for 100 years. They never came to face the I think, the they shouldn't have used that word reconciliation. I think we have a, we have a comment. Yeah. Okay. Jump in yeah. Here. yeah. yeah I, I'm a European Canadian, uh, uh, and I've been a, a working artist all my life, uh, since the age of 20. And uh, so for 40 years, uh, as First Nations people have regained their culture, I've learned from First Nations artists and writers and poets. And I have no problem understanding what they're talking about. And I think that's a, what, uh, like, since when do, did Europeans invent culture? It's a joke. All peoples have culture and art and music. And I have benefited from this resurgence that's happened. But um, I don't see it as a, as a a problem that you're talking about. At I'm all. not saying it's a problem. Well, what, what is it? They're not two worlds. We well, all live uh, in. If you meet these children, you would say it is. Pardon? Wow. I, I don't see it as a, as a problem. No, no, I do a little truth and uh, reconciliation here. <laughs> <laughs> They're both right. Would you like to weigh in a little bit more on that? Or do we have another question coming too? No. Okay. Yeah. I think it was, I was going to ask something similar, but in terms of integrated model versus uh, an authentic uh, representation of the culture. Um, and uh, I guess I'll refer to Malcolm X and, and criticizing kind of integration as eventually being uh, assimilation. So I thought that that's kind of what she asked. Um, I think that in Canada, maybe up till the events on Parliament Hill, when there was a, everybody had a, a rude awakening to what was happening among many disaffected youth in the country, there was always the presumption that cultures could learn from each other, and that uh, you can, uh, and the stronger your roots were that the more self-confident you were, the more you're able to participate in mainstream society. 
you had to buy into a certain set of principles, democracy, respect for others, and all the rest of it. But beyond that, you know, uh, you can be linked to your culture as much as possible, and you can learn from other cultures. Among the native world, uh, they, there were many, many nations in Canada and the United States with distinctive cultures. There were some common factors, but they, there were tremendous differences. And what we have seen over the past 50 years is that there has been a sort of pan-cultural movement that, uh, for example, Pawa, you integrated the big drum of the Sioux with the jingle dancing of the Ojibwe's. Uh, you have the certain war songs from the West together with uh, other types of music from the uh, uh, from woodland people. You have the uh, uh, people uh, being proud of West Coast art and everybody feeling native. Uh, and so that has happened among the native world, and that has been happening as well among the various uh, ethnic communities that make up uh, the non-native world. And I guess, there, however, there are frictions as a result of that, that some people feel that you know, they, in their culture, uh, the role of women was different, and there was uh, things like that, and they rebelled against it. And uh, I think that has, led, and that has led to disaffected youth uh, looking for a cause somewhere. That is sort of one of the uh, byproducts of that. But I hope that we can continue with what we have been doing, and that is learning from each other, uh, not becoming a melting pot, but keeping our culture. And, uh, for example, myself. When I, my mother married a white man when she was 14. When she got married, she was kicked off the reserve because if you married a, a white man, you lost your status. And so we were neither Indian nor white when we grew up. We were in the village when they were mad at us for dirty Indians. Um, or dirty half breeds, something like that. And so, I guess I always was very careful that I was an outsider in the village. And one of the reasons I joined the Foreign Service, I think, was that I could be a Canadian, an unhyphenated Canadian. I could represent Canada, I could be an ambassador for Canada. I didn't wear my identity, ethnic identity, on my sleeve, but I presented it when I had to. But I really felt that I belonged when the government changed the law about Native women and their states. My mother got her status back in 1985. All the kids got, we all got our status back. We were able to go and visit our relatives at, on the Ramah Reserve, because, you know, as one of them. And they welcomed us there. We would be going back, but uh, we couldn't stay overnight and all that sort of stuff. And so I think I've been a, a much more fulfilled person since I'm able to identify myself with the people of the Rama First Nation. So, end of the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question in the middle here. Uh, yeah, thank you for your compelling talk. Um, I'm just wondering, basically, like, why literature? Pardon me? I'm just wondering, like, why literature? Why do you think literature, what's your investment in literature? It seems like almost a, an intrinsic personal investment. They, like, okay, so you get this uh, narrative about um, the commute in the northern communities, and you do an enormous book drive, and then the suicide rate does not increase. You know? And so what's the end of that story? And why do you turn personally to writing fiction and writing literature as your response? Why 
wise editor, I think that uh, uh, when you read a novel, in my opinion, you enter into the minds of the characters. Uh, the, the characters may not have anything to do with you. They're the ones that you have created, but you've also created a movie. And as you're reading that book, you are absorbed in the world of the characters. And you're able to see that these, if, they, if you cut them, they bleed. You're able to cut through the uh, stereotypes and you get a better understanding of the way they feel. And if you get a better understanding of the way they feel, then uh, you are going to treat them in a different way or look at them in a different way. So I think literature has played that role, especially novels over the past 100 years, has played that role in all societies. Um, that, that is, even books which are not overtly uh, serving social justice purposes. They expand your awareness of your common humanity. And so novels play that role. I speak as a great expert, of having written now for about <laughs> six years. Uh, but I've always, I've always felt that. And in terms of, yes, suicide levels have not gone down. On the other hand, I think that we have made progress in the sense of they would have been worse if the kids weren't uh, uh, being exposed to the summer reading camps. And uh, I've been told, my daughter was a doctor in one of these remote communities, so she can tell me that, um, that the kids are, even though they're, they're what the work they submit to me or to the, the, the progress or to the a committee looking at their uh, efforts, that there is a group of young people in every community which is more self-confident and which is now you know, going on to university where it's unheard of before. And so, and, and besides, I'm just Jim Barlow. I am just one of many people but if we had a, a whole pile of us all working, trying to build bridges between the communities and work on the things which are really important, I think literature is really important. Literacy is really important. And I'm really happy that Frontier College, now the 86 communities across Canada, uh, Northwest Territories has adopted it. They pay for it. It's, um, I, I came up with this model. The model was, $33,000 for a camp of 25 kids for three weeks. Because in the pilots I ran, they, they, the pilots that, that the scouts and YMCA and what all, they were charging $300,000 for a camp. So I went up and came up with this model. It has to have involvement in the community. It has to uh, be, the, the community has to provide them with places to stay, the teacher and kids and all the rest of it. The elders have to come in and talk uh, as well. And that's a model that is working. So I'm, I'm very proud of that. Sorry? It's kind of a follow-up. Yeah, sure. Um, Pardon me? Identity. Yes? Because I, I have questions of my own identity. I'm born and raised in Canada. My parents are from the Middle East. I consider myself a Muslim Arab. But at the same time, I, I'm very detached from, I couldn't go to Syria now, obviously, to live in Syria. I don't have any really deeper trail of Syria. And so it, it makes me think about what Canada is as an identity. And when I see um, Aboriginal groups and, and tribes kind of dis uh, disassociating themselves from a Canadian identity that comes from the colonial past, I, I begin to think about colonization and that history. Um, my question is, uh, how like how real is that in the uh, indigenous community? About kind of, you know, I've heard some um, people find it offensive even to consider themselves Canadian. What, what, where did this word come from? Who, who imprinted it on us? 
So, and, the, and they're just kind of holding on to their tribal um, affiliations. I think the uh, race chip of Native people to the Native government of the mainstream Canada is different than the relationship of, of the groups that have come afterwards, for example, from the Middle East to the Canadian government. <laughs> the groups that came afterwards uh, came uh, swearing an oath of allegiance and that they would, that they would accept the, uh, the general principles, democratic principles, and way of life, and all the rest of it. They're buying into something. Whereas the Native people, they were, we were here first. Uh, we are a separate founding nation of the country, whether it's true or not. And therefore, uh, and, the, and this has been recognized in the treaties. And so therefore, the treaties are extremely important. But in my view, and I can only talk about my experience, uh, uh, Native people I know are proud Native. My, uh, my, one of my ancestors, two of my ancestors, fought in the War of 1812 against the nasty Americans. Um, I have relatives who fought in the First World War, in the Second World War, and they're heroes in the community. Um, and so, uh, it's it's a risky thing to say, you know, you're, you're attaching to Canada. But I've always been attached to Canada. People I know have always been attached to Canada see its warts and try to correct it, build bridges, that's all. Uh, I think in a, in a way it's more difficult for Arab Muslims in the sense that uh, I guess your the identity is tied up with the religion uh, to some extent. Uh, and and the, uh, a lot of uh, young people don't, are not interested in the values of mainstream Canadian society. They are ruining their their uh, their, uh, their intrinsic uh, identity. But I, I can't. You can speak to that. I, I couldn't speak. No, to that. I actually, on the contrary, find that more affiliated with Canada. But in terms of like the kind of authentic um, whatever it is, I don't even know what it is. Uh, culture. In Canada, uh, yeah. Like in terms of like, how do they, are they if they're Arab or you know how do they, how do they, what do they identify with? Right? So, so, I guess uh, that's one of the things that the monarchy was uh, so important. Right? Uh, that it was something that people could rally behind, and no matter what your Political affiliation, and that would be, that remains very important uh, to the native people. The ones I know, certainly the ones in northern Ontario, and uh, uh, you know, the members of the royal family. Uh, when they come, they go up to these communities, and when I receive them at Queens Park, and the uh, chiefs were always very happy to see them uh, because. The treaties were signed in the name of either the king or queen, depending on when that occurred. So they are monarchists, probably more monarchists among the native community than there are in this room. <laughs> uh, so that is something which unites them. But everybody here would have a different opinion upon what is a real Canadian. I think a real Canadian is someone who is proud of their, their particular roots and of being Canadian as a whole as well. Don't forget, hilarious and good looking, because that's how I like to get <laughs> uh, I think Canada Reads this year, uh, Joseph Boyden's book, um, uh, The Oneida, was uh, well defended by another popular uh, Indigenous celebrity, Wapkanu, and what he talked about is dividing Indigenous literature from politics. It, it can't be done, is it done in the academy? We talk about it all the time. But I think that, uh, Ms. Bartleman, you represent that very, you know, collision, politics and Indigenous literature coming together at the same time. So I'd like to thank uh, you. Social justice. Social justice. <laughs> thank you. I like it.
Thanks, Frank. But I'd like to thank you for.